Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. I see some people are still trickling in uh, from the waiting room and joining us, but I suggest we can already uh, get started because we have some interesting uh, material and ground to cover uh, in the upcoming two hours. Um, so thank you for joining this EU plant webinar. Um, good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone, uh, depending, of course, where you are joining us from. Um, you are all most welcome. Um, today we're having an EU plant webinar, um, which also serves actually as a lecture of our Chinese law course um, at the law faculty at KU Lüte. Um, and the highly interesting topic for today's discussion is, um, as you can see, uh, the future of the principle of one country, two systems in Hong Kong. Uh, now let me maybe first start off by providing some background on the EU plant project and network. Um, EU plant is a Jean Monnet funded network uh, that studies and teaches about uh, legal and judicial cooperation between China and the European Union. Um, and it is actually comprised of a consortium of different universities um, here in Europe, but also in China. Um, and here in Europe, for example, it includes um, Queen Mary University of London, King's College London and the KU Leuven, um, and in China, also amongst others, um, City University of Hong Kong, to which Professor Lin is uh, affiliated. Um, Professor Lin, our speaker for today. Um, now, before shortly explaining the topic or going into the topic of today's webinar, uh, let me first provide you maybe with some more background details about our speaker. Um, Lin Feng is a professor of law at the City University of Hong Kong, uh, where he's also joining us uh, from right now. Um, and he's also a practicing barrister uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, now he's originally from mainland China um, and holds uh, numerous degrees. Uh, now specifically he holds um, degrees from Fudan University in China um, and also from the Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand. Um, and he obtained his PhD um, from Peking University in China. Um, now his specialization lies in, or he specializes in Hong Kong basic law um, Chinese and comparative constitutional law, um, and also Chinese administrative law. Um, and this actually brings me easily to our topic for today's uh, webinar, um, which you may have read already in the abstract of the invitation um, that was sent around. So you may be, maybe already have an idea of what's to expect. Um, but it is with the specialization of Professor Lin in mind um, that he agreed and is very well positioned uh, to discuss today's topic relating to the one country, two systems principle. Uh, now, the principle of one country, two systems is a principle in Chinese constitutional law um, that has actually gained a lot of attention in recent years, um, especially since 2019 and also last year, 2020, um, in respect of its implementation and operation in Hong Kong. Um, now, as you all likely remember, um, it wasn't so long ago, in 2019, there were massive protests in Hong Kong um, following the proposal of an extradition bill by the Hong Kong government. Um, that would actually allow the extradition um, from Hong Kong to countries that had no formal extradition uh, bill or agreement yet with Hong Kong. And this would lead to actually including mainland China, thus uh, allowing extradition in such certain circumstances from Hong Kong uh, to the mainland. Um, now, while these protests eventually led to the withdrawal of this bill, uh, another piece of legislation entered into force shortly afterwards uh, in 2020, uh, despite its frosty reception. Um, China's top legislator actually passed the national security law uh, for Hong Kong in June of 2020, um, bypassing Hong Kong's local legislator. Um, and many have now asked the question um, whether there is still such a thing as one country, two systems. Um, and this brings us to today's webinar where Professor Lin will provide us uh, with more information on the origin of the principle under Chinese constitutional law. Um, and you will also make reference to the basic law, I think I've understood, um, as uh, that's what the specialization lies in. Um, he will discuss the principles uh, implementation up until June 2020, uh, and also look at the implica implica implications for this principle uh, due to the entry into force of the national security law. Uh, now, before passing the word to Professor Lin, uh, I will just briefly provide an overview of the structure of the webinar. Um, Professor Lin will speak for approximately an hour and 15 minutes uh, around that time. Uh, and afterwards, there will be ample time for Q&A. Um, now to allow the Q&A to uh, occur in an orderly fashion uh, on this or through this online format, uh, we will make use of the chat function uh, here in Zoom. 
Um, so please feel free if you have any questions also throughout the course of Professor Lin's uh, talk, please feel free to already um, drop in these questions in the chat box. Um, so this will allow me to compile them all uh, and then present them to Professor, Professor Lin um, after he concludes his talking points. Uh, Professor Lin has also indicated to me that he will uh, provide a short break uh, in the middle of his talk uh, for a short coffee break, a uh, five minute coffee break or sanitary break. Um, now, lastly, as we're all probably accustomed to already uh, throughout uh, the online meetings over the past year, um, I would uh, like to kindly suggest to maybe keep yourselves all on mute throughout the discussion and throughout the lecture. Um, and um, maybe insofar as possible, uh, it would be nice as you were a group of 29, you're always allowed to keep your video on to make it more interactive, uh, but see if that's possible. Now, if there are any technical issues, also please feel free to use the chat function and I'll try to uh, solve those as quickly as possible. Um, now, without further ado, I think I've uh, taken up already too much uh, of Professor Lin's speaking time. Uh, so again, a very warm welcome to you, Professor Lin. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and I give the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Melinda, for your kind introduction and also setting out uh, the background for today's uh, talk. Okay. So you've seen the topic and uh, the reason uh, why people are questioning whether there is uh, one country, uh, two systems still here in Hong Kong. And uh, what I'm going to do is First, to start from the history and look at the uh, principle in Chinese law and also its status in Hong Kong, and, and then to use the national security law uh, as an example uh, to see uh, how to what extent uh, the law has affected the one country, uh, two system, or the contents of it uh, in Hong Kong. And, uh, then finally offer some of my observations or conclusion. Okay. And you can also, of course, uh, I will eventually will leave it up to you to decide, okay. Uh, come to your own conclusion to what extent the principle of one country, two system has been affected so far. Okay. So if you look at the background for the principle of one country, uh, two systems, and we have to go quickly to the, uh, the 19th century, the three uh, treaties signed between uh, UK and China. Okay. The, after, the, uh, after China was defeated at the uh, Opium War. Okay. So those three treaties led to Hong Kong becoming a colony of UK. And uh, the three treaties, one interesting thing is the second convention of Peking because that leased Hong, uh, the new territories to UK. Okay. The other two treaties led to the secession of two parts, okay. the Hong Kong Island and the Kowloon Peninsula. And the last led to the lease of new territories for 99 years. So that's why, and there was the sort of uh, a return of uh, sovereignty back to China. And of course, after obtaining Hong Kong, UK applied all its laws to Hong Kong, okay. but all legislation and case law. So that's why Hong Kong has been a common law jurisdiction okay, for most, for all the time under the British uh, administration. Okay. And that's the background to have uh, the two systems in Hong Kong. Okay. And then when the lease was about to expire, British government started to discuss uh, with Chinese government about their plan or proposal to renew the lease actually. And, uh, but Deng Xiaoping said that sovereignty is not an issue for negotiation. So actually, if you look into the history, you will find that there are some documents saying that the Chinese senior officials did not want to discuss the future in the 80s of last century. They, they just wanted to keep the status quo. But the British government was concerned about the legality because it, these would expire soon. 
So that pushed for the negotiation and eventually led to the 1984 joint declaration. Okay. So I've put here the main points. So essentially they've agreed Hong Kong will be returned to China and uh, but its capitalist system will be maintained unchanged for 50 years. Okay. So that's the uh, agreement. And uh, there were three uh, annexes uh, to the joint declaration. So those contents in the first and the second joint annexes to the joint declaration, as well as those in the joint declaration were later actually most incorporated into the basic law, which is our uh, mini constitution in Hong Kong. So after the joint declaration, then China, because they've agreed to uh, maintain the capitalist system in Hong Kong for 50 years, at least 50 years unchanged. And thereafter, the 82 constitution was amended by uh, inserting Article 31. So if you look at the source of the one country, two systems, you can go back to trace back to the joint declaration, but at a constitutional level, this Article 31 of the 82 Constitution is the source of the one country, two systems okay, uh, in China. So if you look at, it says, the state may establish spatial administrative regions when necessary. The system to be instituted in spatial administrative regions shall be prescribed by law enacted by the National People's Congress in the light of the specific conditions. Okay. So it's an authorization clause to authorize the legislature, which is the National People's Congress, to enact a law for a particular region. At that time, what's anticipated were actually three, uh, you can say regions, Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan. Okay. So those were the three uh, regions they anticipated uh, to apply. By now, of course, there have been a, the one country to principle, two systems principle has been applied in Hong Kong and Macau. Okay, whether it will be applied to Taiwan, we don't know. Okay, still wait, we need to wait to see. Okay. So if you look at the constitution, we say, and next issue I want to discuss with you a little bit is about the relevance of the Chinese constitution to Hong Kong, and whether Chinese constitution is applicable in Hong Kong. This is a theoretical issue which has not been resolved satisfactorily as far as I'm concerned. The reason is that if you look at the, in, in theory, in constitutional law theory, a sovereign state's constitution should be applicable to the whole territory of the sovereign. I think that's the something which is accepted by everyone. Okay. So a country's constitution is applicable to every part of that country. But then practically, <clears throat> if you look at Hong Kong, what's interesting is because of the Article 31 authorization, China enacted, the MPC enacted the basic law I'm coming to in a minute which will function as Hong Kong's constitution. And the basic law provides that the laws to be applied in Hong Kong will be the basic law or other national Chinese national laws which are listed in Annex 3 of the basic law. And local legislation. But in Annex 3 of the Basic Law, Chinese constitution is not mentioned there. So that has created a very interesting theoretical issue. That is, in theory, Chinese constitution is applicable or should be applicable in Hong Kong. But in practice, because of the Basic Law has not mentioned the Chinese constitution. 
And the basic law is supposed to be the governing constitution for Hong Kong. And we, in which the laws, the applicable laws have been specified. So therefore in practice, Chinese constitution has never been applied in Hong Kong up to now, okay, never been applied. So that's a, I think a, we need to come up with a theory to explain that situation. Why a country's constitution which should be applied in Hong Kong, but in practice has not been applied. Okay. So that's a good question actually for research. But coming back to the, uh, the applicability of the constitution and the official position of uh, mainland Chinese government is that the Chinese constitution and the basic law of Hong Kong together constitute the constitutional foundation of the Hong Kong SDR. That statement I think is fine. I, I don't have any problem with that because later on when we look at, for example, the national security law and uh, some other decisions made by mainland China, particularly the MP, either the MPC or the MPCSC, it's national legislature for Hong Kong. If you go to the basic law, you will find that there are no provisions in the basic law under which the, either the MPC or the MPCSC can make those decisions. For example, those relevant to the uh, electoral reform in Hong Kong. Okay. They, they exercise those authorities under the Chinese constitution. So that's the source. Okay. So that's why the Chinese official position is the constitution and the basic law constitute together the constitutional foundation for Hong Kong. Because without understanding the Chinese constitution, you wouldn't know how the MPC or its standing committee function. Okay. So therefore, we, when we talk about Hong Kong's public law or the constitutional uh, law, we need to know the Chinese system. Okay. We need to know. Another example I can give you briefly is about the interpretation, for example. For the basic laws interpretation, final interpretation authority is with the standing committee of MPC. But how M standing committee of MPC will conduct its interpretation? What's the procedure it will follow to make its interpretation? That's in Chinese law. Okay. You can't find anything in Hong Kong about it. Okay. So, there you need to know something about the Chinese law. So therefore, in order to, for you to understand why the one country, two systems principle was uh, proposed and applied it to Hong Kong. And uh, one thing you need to know is that the two legal systems, particularly the public law systems, uh, in mainland China and Hong Kong are quite different, okay, are quite different. So they're completely two legal systems. Okay. So here I've given you a, a bit of basic uh, characteristics of the Chinese constitutional constitutional system. Uh, some are similar, some are quite different. For example, it, let's go through it very quickly. China is defined as a republic, okay, which is in constitution, it's a unitary state, and it's a socialist state it's made very clearly. Though what's the exact meaning and whether you can tell any difference from the Chinese socialist state from a capitalist state in many other countries. Hard to say from the economic perspective, I can't see any difference to be honest. And the leadership of the communist party, that's the fundamental difference you can say, because Chinese constitution has stated very clearly, China is under the leadership of the communist party. Okay. So that's, uh, in most countries constitution, you can't find that. that. Okay. So in the sense that if you challenge the leadership of the communist party, that will be unconstitutional in mainland China. And the democratic centralism, which is about the organization of institutions, government institutions in China. 
the ideology, guidance of Marxism, Leninism, etc. Okay, and the people's dictator, uh, democratic dictatorship. So that's something different. Uh, the following four, uh, three are similar to most countries. Uh, sovereignty of people, rule, floor, protection of uh, basic rights, all emphasized on the Chinese constitution there. And uh, no, but the next is different. China does not recognize separation of powers doctrine. Okay. What it recognizes is the sort of division of power among different constitutional uh, organs, okay, but not separation of powers. And uh, whereas the National People's Congress and its standing committee is at the top, as the, you can say that at the top of the pyramid, okay, all other constitutional organs are subordinate to the MPC and its standing committee. Okay. So it's more similar to a parliamentary uh, system with the exception of the judicial independence. Okay. Because that system was uh, uh, based on Marxist understanding and uh, ref uh, suggestions to uh, modify or change the British parliamentary system. Okay. So therefore in the Chinese constitutional structure, you can see the sort of uh, a shadow of uh, parliamentary system there because in essence, it's a parliamentary system, but under the leadership of one country and about by also abolishing the independence of the judiciary, okay? To subordinate the judiciary uh, to the leadership of the uh, National People's Congress. Okay. So that's the difference. And another one is quite a unique uh, in China is uh, uh, there's no judicial enforcement of constitutional rights. Okay. So though the fundamental rights are stated in the constitution, which are similar, I wouldn't say exactly the same, similar to those rights protected under the ICCPR. But the difference is you can't go to Chinese courts to enforce those fundamental rights. Okay. So that's the difference. Okay. So that will give you some a uh, rough idea about the main characteristics of the Chinese constitutional uh, law or system. So now let's come to the meaning. What does the principle of one country to system uh, actually mean? And if you go back to the person who is known for uh, creating this principle is Deng Xiaoping. And what is said in the 1980s to a group of Hong Kong people is that, here I've given you the quote from what he said. He said, our policy is to implement one country, two systems. In short, it means in China, the 1 billion Chinese are ruled under the socialist system, whereas Hong Kong, Taiwan will be ruled under the capitalist system. So here's a look at the difference between the socialist system and the capitalist system. Okay. But it's not just the economic, it's everything, okay, basically everything. So the intention at that time is, uh, for him is Hong Kong will, would maintain its status quo. All systems will be kept. The only change, you will say, uh, subject to a few changes, one is sovereignty, okay, that will be changed. Okay. And uh, the second is the, the army. Okay. So British army will return back to UK, whereas Chinese army will be stationed uh, in Hong Kong. And uh, the other major change of course is the uh, final, you will say the judicial File, the power of final adjudication okay, will be with Hong Kong. Okay. So originally we appealed to the Privy Council. Okay. The, the highest court for Hong Kong was Privy Council uh, before 1997. Okay. So basically everything would be uh, maintained. Okay. That, that was why there was a concept called uh, through train. I don't know whether you've heard of that, the through train. 
because there is a train between uh, Hong Kong and Guangdong, okay, next our province next to us. So the train, you get on train in Guangzhou, and then you would not stop at the border. You come directly to the heart of Hong Kong, to uh, Kowloon, and then you depart there and end Hong Kong. Okay, that's why it's called a through train. You don't stop at the border. Okay, so that was used as a metaphor to say the system, the change of sovereignty in 1997 will be like a through train. Okay, all system, everything which was there before July the 1st, 1997, will all transfer smoothly after July the 1st, 1997. Of course, another changes uh, the uh, senior government officials, okay? The governor will be replaced by the chief executive and uh, all those uh, ministers will be changed. Okay? So those, but others would not change at all, okay? And Hong Kong would have a different system. And that system, the details of the system will be set out in a national law, which is the basic law. So that's the idea of the one country, two system. So Hong Kong system will maintain. Mainland Chinese system would not interfere with the Hong Kong system. Okay. So you can see actually the intention was to, you can say separate the two system or maintain the separation of the two system, which was understandable because Hong Kong people at that time was very concerned or worried about the sort of interference from mainland China. Okay. They were worried. Okay. So the Chinese central government wanted to give Hong Kong people the assurance, don't worry, you will maintain your own system. You, are not, you, you will not be asked to apply the Chinese, mainland Chinese system in Hong Kong. Okay. So that's the whole rationale. Okay. So then the basic law was enacted. And that law, we say, is very interesting constitutional document because it's a constitutional document enacted by a socialist Chinese uh, national legislature, but of course with consultation with many people in Hong Kong. Okay. But it's mainly applied in Hong Kong in the common law system in the common law system. So the basic law is where the mainland Chinese civil law system meets converges and conflicts with the common law system in Hong Kong. Because if you look at the two legal systems, the only connecting point is the basic law. Or you can say worse because mm -hmm. after the national uh, security law. Now that's another one. Okay, because before the national security law, that's the only law where the two legal system will converge with each other. Okay, and also because the final interpretation authority of the basic law uh, is with the standing committee of MPC. So therefore, the interpretation power between the courts in Hong Kong may not always, in most cases they don't, but in some constitutional cases, they may conflict with the interpretation of the Standing Committee of MPC. That's why the Standing Committee of MPC has issued so far five interpretations of the basic law, okay? because they were of the view Hong Kong courts either had misunderstood the original intent of the basic law or might misinterpret the original intent of the basic law. So they act uh, before Hong Kong courts in some cases issue its interpretation. So that's uh, why the, the basic law, those who are interested in comparative constitutional law research, I think the basic law and the cases uh, litigated relating to the basic law provide actually rich material for uh, for research to see how the two system uh, may or have conflicted uh, with each other 
and how those disputes have been resolved. So if you look at the status of the basic law, we say in mainland China, it's the law whose status is only lower than the Chinese constitution. But another interesting thing you need to know is that many provisions in the basic law are actually in direct conflict with the, some provisions of the Chinese constitution. Okay. For example, leadership of the Communist Party, which is in Chinese constitution, but not in the basic law. So basically in Hong Kong, in Hong Kong the leadership of the Communist Party is not a legal principle. Okay. So any other parties can be uh, the majority of the Legislative Council in Hong Kong, that's fine. Okay. And the CE does not need to be uh, a Communist Party member at all. Okay. And actually Communist Party is not a proper organization, uh, you can say not a proper political party in Hong Kong. It's not registered as a political party in Hong Kong. Okay. So there are many other uh, places, the provisions in the basic law are actually in direct conflict with the Chinese constitution. Okay. But it's a status, it's an, because it's a national law enacted by the NPC. So Chinese institutions should also follow the basic law or should not do anything in violation of the basic law, okay. even though it's mainly for Hong Kong uh, uh, to be applied in Hong Kong. Whereas in Hong Kong, we say, if you look at the, the very first case decided by uh, the Court of Final Appeal in Hong Kong uh, on the basic law, it, the CFA Court of Final Appeal states very clearly, the basic law is the constitution of the region. Okay. So it's, it's our constitutional document for Hong Kong. Okay, that's very clear. But what's interesting is, it, is actually the previous part of, which are not highlighted in this slide, which has led to the first interpretation by the NPCSC of the Hong Kong Basic Law. Okay, because the, the CFA said they have the constitutional power to review the constitutionality of the acts uh, of the NPC and its standing committee. But that's something the MPC and the MPCSC cannot accept because that authority on the Chinese constitution is with the MPC and its standing committee, not with the courts. Okay. Whereas Hong Kong has inherited the British common law. So the judicial power is with the courts. Okay. Only courts have the power to interpret the law. Okay. So they have come up with this uh, paragraph. Okay. So this, but the status of basic law as the constitution of Hong Kong is not questioned. Though Chinese scholars and the government, you can say official position is that they say they don't like the constitution, the word constitution. They say it's a mini constitution or a constitutional document because their interpretation of constitution is a, is a narrow uh, interpretation. They say a country, a sovereign state can only have one constitution. So if you start from this condition, obviously the basic law is not a constitution. Okay. But if, if you accept the argument that a country, a sovereign country can have constitution at a different levels of the country, the, the, take the US for example, a federal uh, country, you have the federal constitution, you have the state constitution, okay? Because essentially it's the, the document that constitute the organization, okay? So here, of course, we are talking about the, either a regional government or a sovereign government, okay? But in Hong Kong, most people accept it's the constitutional document of Hong Kong. So some people now, in order to be politically correct, they may say it's the uh, constitutional document, not call it a constitution. But in essence, that I don't see any difference there. Okay. 
So another sentence said by the CFA in this case is that the basic law is an entrenched constitutional document that implement the unique principle of one country, two systems. So that means this, if you know what's exactly meant by the principle of one country, two systems, actually can go to read the basic law, okay? go to read the basic law. So in the basic law, actually the principle itself, you can say it's not defined anywhere. Okay? So that's why it has led to different interpretations over the years. Okay? And uh, the result is that Hong Kong people, uh, legal scholars in Hong Kong and legal practitioners uh, from Hong Kong, they tend to emphasize the difference of the two legal systems or to emphasize the two system aspect that Hong Kong is different from mainland China. Whereas mainland China or Chinese scholars or government would emphasize more on the one country aspect. So both sides emphasize what they want to emphasize. Okay. So there is no guiding principle on how to achieve a sort of balance between the two. So that's why we had many uh, arguments over the last two decades between mainland China and Hong Kong on the implementation of this principle. So if you look at one country, we say the those essential emphasis on one country from the uh, or in the basic law is here I've given you a, a few of them. One is the principle itself, okay? the territorial integrity. Okay? Hong Kong is an inalienable part of PRC. Okay? And the second emphasis is on the sovereignty. Okay? So China has sovereignty over Hong Kong. Okay? So those two are emphasized the most uh, by the mainland Chinese officials and also uh, scholars and also the source of power because it's sovereignty. Okay, China has sovereignty over Hong Kong. So therefore the source of power, they say, is from central government because China is a unitary state. Okay. So it's a delegation of power from the central government to Hong Kong SAR. So central government is the source of the power. Okay. That's stated very clearly in uh, article two of the basic law. Okay. The NPC authorizes Hong Kong SAR to exercise a high degree of autonomy. Okay. Then if it, but most parts of the basic law or most articles in the basic law are actually on the autonomy part. Okay. So what specific powers Hong Kong uh, enjoys under the basic law? So what are within the autonomy part? Okay. So most provisions are that. Apart from the general authorization under Article 2, which I've just referred to, and then in different parts of the basic law, and there are basically, you can say, all powers which are needed for a government have been delegated to Hong Kong, and even more. Okay. For example, legislative power, okay, delegate to Hong Kong, uh, Legislative Council, executive power, delegate to Hong Kong, okay? And uh, the, the next two are actually more than you can say uh, a state enjoys within a federal government, federal country, independent judicial power, because that includes the final adjudication. Okay. In other words, all cases were finished in Hong Kong. Okay. Now, of course, under the national security law, there's an exception. Okay. I'll, I'll talk to that in a minute. And uh, the fourth is also beyond uh, more or than a state enjoys under a federal uh, country. Power to handle external affairs. That's, ex you may say, what's external affairs? It's actually, if you look at sovereign country, 
all those power under the external affairs are actually defined as foreign affairs. But because Hong Kong as a colony exercised those power before the change of sovereignty, so central government decided to let Hong Kong keep those power. So they give it a new term called external affairs. For example, to enter into extradition treaty with other countries. That's defined as an external affair. So not for central government, it's for Hong Kong SAR government. So that's a typical foreign power, okay. So, so those are the enumerated powers under the basic law. And if those are not enough, and if necessary, on the Article 20 of the basic law, central government can actually grant more authority to Hong Kong if necessary, okay. So that, the implication of that is the residue power is with the central government not with Hong Kong. So, but if you want, they can further delegate those power to Hong Kong. Okay. So that's the rationale. So if you look at those detailed enumerated powers, it's very clear to see the intention of the basic law is to separate the two systems, okay. separate the Hong Kong system from the Chinese system. So that's the intention, very clear. So now let's come to the Article 23 uh, legislation. Okay. The same, Article 23 legislation, you can say essentially it's about the national security issues. But the problem is the national security issues in, if you look at the constitutional principle in most countries, that's the authority of the central government. But then the penalty for infringement of national security is actually criminal penalty, okay? In most cases, a criminal penalty. Whereas Hong Kong's criminal law is completely different from mainland Chinese criminal law. So then through the negotiation, and it is in, in the sort of drafting of the basic law, eventually they came up with this Article 23. That is to authorize the central government through Article 23 to authorize Hong Kong SAR legislature to enact its own national security law. That's the essence of Article 23 legislation. Okay. Because on the one hand, this article shows, look, the authority is with me. The source of power is with the central government. But because of your concern, we delegate that power to you to enact the law. Okay. So that's the rationale behind, okay. and why uh, we have this Article 23 uh, authorization. Okay. But then what happened was, we, over the years, we had a lot of disputes and uh, the first attempt in Hong Kong to enact the Article 23 legislation was in 2003. Okay. So at that time, government actually came up with a bill. It's called the National Security Legislative Provisions Bill. Actually, to, uh, the bill was to create a couple of new offenses under Article 23, which we did not have in Hong Kong, and then to revise or amend other uh, local legislation. Okay. So that, that was the intention of the Article uh, 23 legislation. And the government has had actually accepted uh, most recommendations from the uh, legal community in Hong Kong to ensure the national security uh, bill was consistent with the ICCPR. So that was the int intention. But then, because the, the pan-democratic uh, group or camp wanted the government to issue a white paper to do a formal consultation. And the Hong Kong government said, no, we're not going to do it. Because we've more or less agreed on the substance of the, the bill. 
why do we still need to go through the formality of consultation? So because of that, uh, and then also because at that time, Hong Kong's economy was not good. So therefore, half a million of people went on street. And of course, if you ask those people, I'm pretty sure that maybe at most 20 or 30% of people went on street because of the bill. Others are for various other reasons. Okay, They're unhappy with the performance of the government. So that led to the government's decision to withdraw the bill from the leg legico. Okay. So that the first attempt failed. So ever since then, neither the government, particularly the chief executive, okay, nobody thereafter wanted to propose the uh, Article 23 legislation anymore. And also the pan Democrats oppose it. Nobody wants to introduce it. Even though the central government asked, you can say repeatedly, that it's your constitutional duty to enact the Article 23 legislation, but has not been done in Hong Kong. So then uh, quite a few uh, incidents or events happened uh, from 2003 up to now. And here I just uh, uh, cite two examples. Okay. One is the demand for direct election of uh, the chief executive and uh, the LegCo, what we call the double uh, universal suffrage. Okay. And uh, because the Standing Committee of MPC made a decision in August 2013 on how to conduct the direct election. Okay. Basically, they agreed, central government agreed to have direct election of CE okay, in 2017. But they, they set a sort of, uh, they included a screening process of candidates uh, in the decision. Okay. So that's something uh, was not acceptable to the pan Democrats in Hong Kong. Okay. That has led to the Occupy Central uh, movement or the umbre umbrella movement. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. Okay. But of course, after the umbrella movement, the central government did not give in. Okay. So that's why we still haven't got the uh, universal suffrage of the chief executive. Okay. And after that movement, many, uh, you can say local activists started to advocate either for independence of Hong Kong or for what they call the local or semi quasi independence. Okay. So, some local groups have argued for that. For example, one example I've given you here is the Hong Kong National Party. Okay. It's put in the, in, as one of its objective is to achieve Hong Kong independence. Okay. In the party's portfolio said very clearly. Okay. Then that one was prohibited of course, uh, by the Hong Kong government. So that sort of more and more people, uh, there's one uh, survey saying that uh, close to about 20% uh, of voters in the, uh, in the 2016 uh, legislative election, they actually voted for those candidates who are pro-independence. Okay. So that I think has, a, given a sort of shock uh, to the central government okay, about the possibility of independence. And then another incident, of course, is what Melina has also uh, mentioned is the extradition uh, legislation and the anti-extradition movement. That really surprised the central government. 
And because Hong Kong was uh, certain, I'm sure many of you have watched TV, it's certain places in Hong Kong apart looked like a war zone during that period. Okay. And uh, also later the sort of persuasion by some political uh, figures or bodies in Hong Kong to persuade uh, the foreign governments to sanction Hong Kong and the mainland China have also uh, made the central Chinese government very unhappy. So those eventually led to their decision to enact the uh, national security law for Hong Kong. So if you look at the, how they have enacted the law, the process is interesting. First, the National People's Congress made a decision. This is the first one is the decision of the NPC. And then that decision essentially authorizes the, it's a standing committee to enact the national security law of Hong Kong. You may say, why? Why doesn't it enact the law itself or simply just uh, let the NPCSC to enact the law? Why they, there are, were two steps there. And uh, my interpretation of it is that they should have got the advice from Chinese constitutional scholars. Because if you look at the basic law, Article 23 is in the basic law, right? Which authorizes Hong Kong legislature enact its own national security law. But then if you allow the MPCSC to directly enact the national security law, then a constitution argument can be raised that because of the legal status of MPCSC is lower than MPC. So the laws enacted by the MPCSC would also be lower than the laws enacted by the MPC. So that means the basic law will override any laws enacted by the MPCSC. So the national security law enacted will be at a lower status in legal hierarchy than the basic law. That's the concern. So now with this authorization, the decision that can say, look, decision of the MPC is at the same level with the basic law, right? They're all made by the MPC. So therefore this decision has actually elevated the national security laws legal status to be the same as the basic law. Therefore, you cannot challenge it by saying that its status is lower than the basic law. Therefore, it's unconstitutional. So this argument cannot be raised. I'm pretty sure it's one of those uh, constitutional scholars have given the advice. Otherwise, the, if it's a pure matter happening in mainland China, I don't think they would bother to do this, to, to go through these two steps. Okay. So there, considered it for Hong Kong, okay. So that's the way they've enacted. Now let's have a look at the uh, national security law itself, okay. The objectives, so you can have a look at article one and three, I, I will skip it. Basically, if you look at the main, I summarize the objectives into three things, okay. One is to declare its authority of national security saying that that national security matter is a central government's matter, okay? So make it very clear, it's not for local government. Now we are gonna do it, okay, not for you. And the second is to fill in the legal vacuum because we've, the central government, their argument is we've given you the opportunity to enact your own law for over two decades, you failed to do that. So therefore we're gonna do it. Otherwise there is a, serious threat to national security. And the main concern of the central government seems to be a color revolution. That's the main concern there. And another thing objective they've achieved, which is something they wanted to achieve for a long time, but I couldn't find a way to do it, 
but through this national security law, they've done it. That is to establish the relevant institutions in Hong Kong and to integrate Hong Kong's national security system into mainland Chinese national security system. Okay. The integration, because the, we've talked about the purpose on the Article 23 is, is to have two separate systems. But through the national security law, the two actually integrated. So how that is achieved? That's through the institutions. So let's have a look at the institutions, okay? So before, in the colonial times, before the change of sovereignty, there was a unit within the colonial government, within the uh, police, which is in charge of the national security. And it's called the political departments or political unit uh, within, the, within the police, which is in charge of all security, national security matters okay, for the British government. But then that unit was abolished before the change of sovereignty. So therefore from 97 up to June last year, there was no unit within the Hong Kong government which is actually in charge of national security. And also, even though the central government was very concerned about the national security issue in Hong Kong. They could not interfere at all, okay? Because there is no institution which can function in Hong Kong for the national security concerns of the mainland Chinese government. No way they could interfere. So they always want to reestablish the sort of political unit within the police to be in charge of national security. But because the Hong Kong government has did not do anything, so therefore they could not do it. And the anti-extradition movement provides the perfect justification for the enactment of the national security law. Okay. For them to extend the Chinese national security institutions to Hong Kong. And also integrate the Hong Kong system into China. So if you look at the four institutions under the national security law, you will see. So the first institution they set up in Hong Kong is the Office for Safeguarding National Security for the Central Chinese, uh, Central People's Government in Hong Kong SR. So that's an extension of the Chinese National Security Office okay, to Hong Kong. So this office consists of all people coming directly from mainland China from different ministries which are related or which are relevant to national security. Could be from the Ministry of National Security, could be from the Ministry of Defense, could be from the Ministry of Public Security. Okay. So all those which are related, they can send their people to this office okay, to deal with the national security issue in Hong Kong. So that's a central government's office established in Hong Kong under the new national security law. And the second is a committee for safeguarding national security. That's a local Hong Kong com committee, okay? So Hong Kong government is required to set up a committee for safeguarding national security. That committee consists of the chief executive, all main secretaries in Hong Kong, those ministers, and with a national security advisor from the central government, designated by the central government. And that person is the head of the central liaison office in Hong Kong. So the head of the central liaison office, office in Hong Kong is now the national security advisor to this committee chaired by the chief executive in Hong Kong. So basically that committee need to listen and follow the advice given by the uh, national security advisor. So in that way, as far as national security matters are concerned, the central liaison office is integrated 
inducted into the Hong Kong governance structure. And then the third is a local department for safeguarding national security uh, with law enforcement capacity within the police. So basically that's, you can say, is equivalent to the old political uh, unit or department okay, to be specially in charge of national security. And then a special prosecution uh, division within uh, the Department of Justice for the prosecution part, if there are any crimes. Okay. So the, the first will advise the, the other three. Okay. So in that way, you can see now the two national separate, originally intended two separate national security systems are integrated, okay? And they're under the direct leadership and the guidance of the Office for Safeguarding National Security. Okay. That means under the central government. So completely integrated as far as national security matters are concerned. So that's the you can say, so I've given you more details about the, the sort of institutions and because of the uh, time, I think I'm not going to uh, go into the details of those. Okay. Yeah, now I see it's about four. Shall we have a break, short break for five minutes? And then uh, we'll continue thereafter. So from the uh, brief uh, discussion of the institutions uh, before the break, and you, you can see those char characteristics I've uh, summarized here on this slide. So I'm not going to go uh, repeat those, okay? So now, if you look at the impact Later, I'm going to talk a, a bit more about the impact. If you look at the result of the national security uh, law, and uh, one thing it has achieved is through the national security, uh, the integration of the two national security systems. Okay. And, but if you, I don't know whether you follow the development of it. If you, if you followed and one strong criticism of the national security law is actually that the law has listed three categories of national security cases, which will be directly handled by the office, not by the Hong Kong police, will be directly handled by the office, and then would be prosecuted and a trial in mainland China, not in Hong Kong. Okay. So three categories of cases. I think I've listed an article somewhere. Uh, I don't know where I've put it. Never mind. you can read it there. It's article 55 of the law. And to me, later I'll explain to you why. It's a, it's a less concern because those three categories, my interpretation of that is, it's the sort of, uh, or it will only happen, put it this way, that if the situation in Hong Kong with regard to national security could not be handled or could no longer be handled by the Hong Kong SAR government, then, the office will intervene directly. In most cases, the office would simply supervise the work of the committee and give instructions to uh, the special department within the police. They would not handle the cases themselves. Okay. So if they handle it, that means it's out of control in Hong Kong either factually 
or in the opinion of the central government, it's out of control of the Hong Kong. Hong Kong government could not handle it properly. Then they, they would take it over and send to mainland China for trial, for prosecution and trial. Okay. So the, I'm not that concerned with the actual application of that uh, article because some scholars in Hong Kong have argued that like uh, the, the recent trial of uh, the pan Democrats said like uh, the, the owner of the one media should be handed over to China, should be, his case should be uh, handled by the office and sent back to mainland China for trial. And I, I said to some media when they asked me, I said, I can't believe that case would be handled by the office directly. Because it's not a, that serious case. Hong Kong government is fully competent to handle those cases. And uh, it turned out it's tried in Hong Kong. Okay, whether that he should be tried or not, that's another issue, okay? But the case itself could be handled in Hong Kong. Then it wouldn't be handled. It wouldn't be handed over to the office and the man in China, okay? So uh, that's for the uh, institutions. And now if you look at the two SARs in Hong Kong, that is to compare Hong Kong with Macau, What's interesting is that China has more control over the national security matters in Hong Kong than in, in Macau. Because Macau, a few years back, they, Macau enacted its own national security law on the Article 23. So as a result, there's still de facto you can say two separate system between Macau and mainland China. Whereas in Hong Kong, our system has been completely integrated as an integral part of mainland Chinese national security system. So that's uh, quite uh, ironic. But then the actual crimes, uh, set out in the, or covered by the national security laws are four, four of them, secession, uh, subversion, terrorism, and the collusion with uh, foreign forces. Okay. And actually all those, according to one senior Chinese officials, why those four, they said, were included in the national security law? Because those, or the incidents happened during the uh, Occupy Central movement and the uh, anti-extradition movement have led them to the concern of those four. So that's why those four crimes were actually included. And uh, those, some specific uh, detailed provisions are actually targeting. They didn't, they said it very clearly to target those incidents happened uh, during those two movements. Otherwise, they wouldn't write those specific uh, provisions or some of those specific provisions. So if you're interested, you can go to uh, read the law itself, okay, about how those provisions are written. I would not go would not have time to uh, go into the details of those provisions. Okay. So now if we compare the two, okay, the sort of, uh, you can say the one country, two systems under the original Article 23 are envisaged under the original Article 23 and under the uh, national security law. You can see some difference. One thing I've em emphasized is the duality of the national se security system under Article 23. But now under the national security law, it's integrated, it's an integral part. Okay. So that's, you can say one difference in the sense certain powers have clearly taken, certain powers have been taken away from Hong Kong. 
and uh, to enable the central government to have more control of national security matters in Hong Kong. Okay. And uh, that's the main thing they have, they have achieved. And some time ago, actually, when it was, I think it was in last year, uh, before in last April, not last April, yeah, April last year, we had a conference in Hong Kong talking about national security law. And I was still advocating at that time that Hong Kong should enact its own Article 23 legislation as soon as possible. Because if or had we enacted the national security law on Article 23 as required, and there wouldn't be an excuse for the, for the central government to say, suddenly I want to enact a law for Hong Kong. And then I want to establish an office in Hong Kong. Okay, like in Hong Macau, they've never made that proposal or made the decision to do that. Okay. So had we done it, the legislation with hindsight a bit earlier, we wouldn't end up as what we are today. Okay. So that eventually, that it's, a, it's something uh, regretful uh, to a certain extent. And even at that time when we had the uh, conference, I didn't expect uh, that the national security law would be enacted so quickly, okay, so quickly, very swift, swiftly, you can say. And for the, the other matter is, I think if you look at the impact of the national security law, now actually that's national security law is of, of course one example, there are several other examples I wouldn't have time to talk about, is we now have to take the Chinese claim, which I mentioned before, that the constitution and the basic law together constitute the constitution of basis or foundation for the Hong Kong SAR. Because in Hong Kong, in Hong Kong for years, our legal, legal uh, community is, majority of our legal community is against the claim that the Chinese constitution is also the constitution of foundation for Hong Kong. Most people are unwilling to accept that, are actually against it. Because the rationale in Hong Kong for most scholars or legal communities that because we have the basic law as our constitution, okay, our constitution documents. So everything happened or done which will have an effect in Hong Kong must have a source from the basic law. Even the Chinese government, the central government, if you want, they want to do anything which will have an impact in Hong Kong, they must have a source in the basic law. That's very ideal and that's good for Hong Kong, okay? That's what we want for Hong Kong. But then the political reality is Hong Kong is only part of, is a spatial administrative region within a non-democratic sovereign. And uh, the SAR does not have equal bargaining power with the sovereign. But we have acted over the years as if we had that bargaining power, equal bargaining power with the sovereign. Okay. And the sovereign, of course, they, when the MPC and the state, it's a standing committee act. What they will look at immediately is the Chinese constitutional framework and the Chinese constitution. What they're concerned about is whether it's constitutional or whether they had authority under the Chinese constitution to make those decisions. So at the best, I think what we can do, of course we can persuade them but if, if we can't persuade them to accept our approach, the best we can do is to make a compromise with them. 
So it's not a legal bargaining there. Okay, you don't have the equal bargaining power. Okay. So that's something many people in Hong Kong have not realized. Okay, have actually led to the current situation. Okay. So that's uh, something I cautioned uh, those participants uh, at the uh, conference we uh, Hong Kong U organized uh, last year. And uh, what else I want to say here? Okay. Yeah, the structure which I've already mentioned, so I wouldn't go uh, repeat it again. But if you look towards the uh, future, I'm not as pessimistic as some other uh, scholars who are researching uh, doing research about the Hong Kong's constitutional system. And like, for example, a former uh, professor at Hong Kong, Carol uh, Peterson, who has argued that the firewall now is completely damaged. So there is no future for Hong Kong, basically. But I'm sort of cautiously optimistic in the sense that I believe the two systems can still be maintained to, in most circumstances. Okay. The reason I've explained uh, briefly before, that is for if you look at the operation of or the implementation of the national security law, it's primarily the job of the Hong Kong SAR and specifically speaking, the Hong Kong police, the spatial specialized department within the police and the special unit within the DOJ to do the prosecution. Okay. If they can convey the message to the office on national security and also to the central government of that, don't worry, we, Hong Kong SAR can handle those cases properly, no problem. And then, the office and the central government would not interfere. So then most matters will still remain in the hands of the Hong Kong SAR, okay. still in our hands. So to that extent, I would say the uh, two systems would be maintained as, as, as far as its operations concerned. But of course, what has been inter integrated, you can, I don't think you can disintegrate it because the integration has already been made in the sense that they need to get instructions uh, from the office, okay, from the national security advisor. But even as separated as in Macau, there's actually de facto communication there between them. Okay. I don't think anybody can deny that okay, as far as national security issues are concerned but not as integrated as us. So that's why I say I'm uh, cautiously uh, optimistic. Okay. But of course, whether that will become a reality depends on the proper enforcement of the national security law okay. and how they enforce it. And uh, my view is that because th there should be a proper balance of course, certain matters they are definitely you can say they are can be classified as endangering the national security. Okay, but some other matters, whether they are, they may be borderline cases. Okay, because if you look at the national security law, in the general clauses part, it's stated there very clearly. The fundamental rights of people will be protected. So therefore, in the enforcement of the national security law, there is a balance between the two, okay? So why enforcing the national security law to ensure the national security? Those individuals' rights should also be protected. Okay? Because Article 39 in the basic law has said very clearly the ICCPR as implemented in, in Hong Kong will continue to be in force. 
something like that. Okay. So that is through the Bill of Rights Ordinance in Hong Kong. So all those rights written in the ICCPR are actually effective in Hong Kong. Okay. So the government should not over enforce the NPC, the national security law. Okay. They should achieve a balance. So if they can achieve the proper balance there, and I believe, or I will remain cautious and optimistic. Okay. And of course, if you read the national security law, it also says that Hong Kong government should still enact Article 23 legislation. The reason is that if you compare the crimes covered by the Article 23 and the national security law, they're actually somewhat uh, there are overlaps, but some are not covered because N national security law only covers four okay, crimes, okay, four crimes. And uh, you can say the last two about the political organizations, if you count it as one, there are actually two which are missing, which in Article 23, but not under the national security law. So for those Hong Kong government still has the constitutional obligation to uh, improve its local legislation. Okay. So that's the meaning for the Article 23 legislation. But I don't think it's necessary for Hong Kong to enact laws on those four crimes which are already covered uh, by the national security law. Because it serves no purpose. The national security law has already been elevated to the status of basic law. Whatever you enact, you can only supplement those four crimes already covered by national security. You cannot override them. Okay. So I wouldn't bother with those four, which are already covered. Okay. And also, though the firewall, firewall has been what I call semi-removed, but there is a still possibility for us in Hong Kong to maintain a sort of uh, high degree of autonomy. Okay. So it's still possible. Okay. So finally, I have a few things to say. One is if you look at what we've discussed so far, you will see that the contents, what I call the contents of the principle of one country, two systems have evolved over the years. By saying that, what I mean is the matters which were originally are supposed to be within the scope of autonomy have, some of them have moved to the scope of one country means to the central government. So that has, has shifted the balance. What should be within the scope of the one country, meaning uh, for the central government, and what should be for the autonomy of SAR. That has actually shifted over the years. And also the central government, if you look at the original intention, of complete separation of two system. The rationale is also evolving over the years. Because now, the, if you look at the, what happened over the 20 years, it's very interesting. At the very beginning, the first 10 years, Guangdong province, including Shenzhen, and many provinces in China, actually wanted to cooperate with Hong Kong. And Hong Kong is saying, no, no, we don't want to. We want to maintain separate system. But in the last decade, because of the economic development in mainland China, and Hong Kong actually wants to integrate with certain parts of China, particularly the southern part and eastern part of China. That's why the central government has come up with the Greater Bay Area strategy. Okay. But now it's come up to them. They are saying that, no, wait a minute. Why should we cooperate with you? 
What can you bring to us? But anyhow, the intention now from the central government is to have more integration between Hong Kong and at least the Guangdong province. Okay. That's the whole purpose for the Greater Bay Area strategy. But the problem is the basic law has set out a very rich separation of two systems. So therefore, certain those rigid provisions in the basic law have become the obstacle for the integration. Because they are hard laws, hard rules. You cannot violate unless you amend the basic law. Okay. So the sort of uh, approach has changed. Hong Kong government, I wouldn't say all Hong Kong people, actually some Hong Kong people still don't want to integrate with mainland China. Okay. But certain parts of Hong Kong people, they want to integrate, particularly those in business. Okay. But that the the sort of basic law has become a hurdle there. Okay. So that's another interesting uh, phenomenon. And another point I want to make is, I would argue that a new constitutional normalcy or normality is forming or is taking shape in the sense that the National People's Congress and its standing committee rely more and more on its authority within the Chinese constitution or under the Chinese constitution to deal with matters which the Hong Kong government feels either reluctant or unwilling to address. Typical example is the electoral reform. So they all basically say, you do it. Central government, you do it. If we do it in Hong Kong, we'll encounter a lot of uh, opposition. And uh, so therefore, if you do it, then it's under Chinese constitution, no authority, then nobody will say anything here. You can do it push forward faster than in Hong Kong. So actually, if you look at the decisions made by the NPC, or it's a standing committee. They've done it more and more actually in the past few years than in the first 15 years. Okay. So I think that will become a sort of more uh, a new constitutional normalcy for Hong Kong. Okay. And the final point I want to make is that, uh, which I already uh, alluded to a bit in the before, because Hong Kong is within the non-democratic uh, sovereign, okay? So there can't be, there or there does not exist a neutral arbiter, arbiter <clears throat> for any disputes between Hong Kong SAR and mainland China and the sovereign. So therefore, it's unrealistic to expect a legal resolution of a dispute between Hong Kong and uh, Manna China, the central government. So the solution lies in politics or the solution can only be a political solution. So that means we Hong Kong politicians or people should be willing to compromise, okay? You go to bargain and then when necessary you need to compromise so long as you can achieve the best result for Hong Kong, okay? Otherwise you say, every time you want to confront directly to stick to your principles, that would lead to nowhere and even get even worse situation as we, we've got under the national security law. Okay, I think I will stop here, okay, thanks. Hey, thank you very much, Professor Lin, uh, for this very interesting uh, webinar and your talking points. Uh, I think it was very interesting to learn more about, and you've definitely provided us with a better understanding 
of uh, the constitutional principle of one country, two systems, uh, but also the implications of the national security law. Um, and thank you also for these concluding remarks with uh, your viewpoints uh, on, on looking ahead a bit. Uh, I see that we've uh, received a couple of questions already in the chat box. Um, I will present these maybe uh, one by one to you and then we can go over them. Um, but of course, uh, to the audience, if there are any more additional questions, feel free to still uh, add to the chat box uh, while we discuss the uh, uh, questions that are already there. Um, I see that there is a question by um, Jean-Raphael. Um, I think there are several questions, but I think I can combine them a bit as they have something to do with each other. Um, Jean-Raphael um, refers to the joint declaration um, whereby China agreed to keep the status quo for the next 50 years, um, whereby China would not interfere as much in internal affairs or would provide um, more autonomy to Hong Kong uh, for the next 50 years. Um, however, um, he states then here, um, or he, he observes or asks the question, does the national security law then violate the joint declaration, which is considered an international treaty um, now that its legal instruments have been submitted to the UN by both parties. So I think this goes to the question of, of your view, if is the joint declaration an international treaty and does the national security law then, then violate it in that respect? Uh, okay. Yeah, this issue, uh, I haven't done deep research into it, but I think the essential argument here is you need to go to the joint declaration to see uh, the substance in it. And my view is, Without doubt, the joint declaration is a bilateral treaty between UK and the mainland China. So its status is a bilateral treaty. So then you need to go into the joint declaration say, to look at what's exactly included there, the promise. Okay. I think the essential argument there is the high degree of autonomy. Okay. So high degree of autonomy, where the high degree of autonomy has been infringed. So then the comparable point, of course, is you say whether the basic law has, no, not, not the basic law, the joint declaration has a fixed, a set criteria, put it in this way, set criteria for the high degree of autonomy. And uh, that one, uh, my view would be it's difficult to argue, but what can be argued is if you compare the high degree of autonomy under the basic law enacted and then now with the supplement of the national security law, whether the high degree under the basic law alone is broader than under the net basic law plus national security law. And I tend to agree that under the, with the NSL, the scope for high degree of autonomy has become smaller. And the essential argument is that Article 23 authorizes Hong Kong to enact those laws. But then the counter argument for that is, at least that's the argument from uh, Albert Chen from uh, Hong Kong U Law School. And he said, if you look at Article 23 authorization, his argument is the sovereign mainland Chinese central government has given Hong Kong the opportunity to enact the lo local national security law for more than two decades, but you failed to do it. So now the sovereign actually is exercising that authority because you failed to do that. But whether, so there, there are more views into it. I will put it in this way, okay. The scope has been narrowed down, but because there are some factors there which led to the taking back of the authority. So I don't know whether I've answered the question. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, ooh, I see my lights are turning out here in the auditorium. Sorry for that. Uh, I see one additional question as well uh, from uh, Leah. 
Uh, and this has more with the perspective of also towards Taiwan then. Um, and she um, observes that the one country policy is one of the main parts of Xi's China dream. Um, and she um, notes down that China will not have recovered from the century of humiliation until Taiwan is part of China again. Um, and she notes as well that there have been several studies about the contacts between uh, pro-independence and autonomy movements in Taiwan and Hong Kong. And therefore she asks the question, um, would it be on, in China's interests uh, to respect the one country, two systems principle with a view of kind of persuading um, Taiwan to join China under that same principle, maybe with a combination of soft and hard power? Um, Right. The answer would be yes, definitely will be in China's interest for, for it to honor the uh, one country, two systems. To, if Hong Kong can uh, be a good example, okay, and actually that was the original intention, okay, hoping the implementation of the principle of one country, two systems in Hong Kong could set a good example so that Taiwan will be willing to get united with uh, Mainland China. The, if you look at also the latest uh, Taiwan uh, election, you would see actually Hong Kong set a bad precedent and that has led to Chai Ing Wen uh, had a big win in the election. So that I would agree. <clears throat> I think here for Hong Kong, the main concern for the central government that's my interpretation, okay? Their belief or their view is that certain bottom line or bottom lines they had in mind had been crossed this time. But whether they had been crossed or not, that's a separate issue. And their interpretation is certain bottom lines have, have been crossed. So therefore, they want to tighten the control. And I think there are several factors there. One is certain political figures. Take the independence, for example, <clears throat> argument for independence or advocacy for independence. Personally, uh, I've lived here for uh, over two decades. Okay? And I don't think it's, a, it's an issue for Hong Kong. Because most people in Hong Kong, they fully realize it's impossible for Hong Kong to be independent. And the majority of people don't want to, Hong Kong to be independent. So it's only because the issue has caught the eyes of certain political figures. They made a big fuss out of it. And then those local politicians, young people thought, oh, it's an eye-catching word. So therefore, many people started to use that in order to attract the media attention. It's never been a sort of serious matter for Hong Kong. But for Communist Party, the bottom line is territorial integrity. Territorial integrity is the most basic bottom line. Nobody should ever touch. So when certain politicians have made that a big issue, saying that some people want to get independent, get Hong Kong as the independent. Who dares to say, don't worry about it. We as the academic, we can argue, we can say that's not an issue. But politicians, they need to be politically correct. They have to toe the line of the, of the party. Separation is not an issue which can be negotiated. Any attempt must be stamped out. So that ha had been used as a sort of a political thing, which I'm personally not happy with. So that has led to the sort of deterioration and uh, the central government did decide to set a few, uh, to make our sort of fundamental change actually to the Hong Kong's political uh, structure and the power uh, organizations actually. The whole rules of game have been changed by now. Okay. So that was 
what has led to the result. Of course, they've achieved something they always wanted to do for many years. That's the integration of the national security system. So they, my interpretation is they realized there would be some negative impacts. But on the other hand, they will gain something. So it's a sort of, uh, to me, it's a sort of, they've done their political calculation to see whether they benefit more or lose more. And I believe their decisions, they can gain more, even though they've lost something. Yeah. Thank you for that insight, Professor. Um, I actually had one uh, question myself as well, as I'll take the privilege of being a moderator to be able to ask it as well. Um, you mentioned uh, throughout your webinar uh, the Nka Link case, uh, whereby that uh, courts in Hong Kong can then examine um, acts to ensure that they um, are consistent with the basic law of Hong Kong. Um, and this actually reminded me then also, of, of course, of the Chiu Link case uh, in the mainland, uh, whereby that there there was uh, an opening for constitutional litigation, but that thereafter um, the Supreme Court had an opinion uh, whereby it kind of reversed its decision there. I was wondering if um, following the Nunca Link case, if there was also any um, sort of opinions or any other um, uh, statements that were made from the mainland that kind of uh, downplayed the importance of that case or not? Uh, that's the interpretation, the first interpretation. The interpretation. Yeah, first in the update, yeah. Because the Chi Lin, you say, of course, that's a sort of, you can say, the judicial activism from the court, mm -hmm. the Supreme People's Court, and which, of course, they, they self, <laughs> you can say, did the self rectification by abolishing that uh, interpretation. Mm -hmm. And for Hong Kong, and if you, in Kaolin is, uh, is an ambitious case by the, our first chief justice, because through Nkaling, he wanted to make it as a case like uh, Marbury versus Madison in Hong mm -hmm. Kong. So that's his actual whole intention, to set up the constitutional re review framework for Hong Kong. But then that touched the bottom line of the MPCSC, because the MPCSC is of the view the court's CFA has exercised its power. So that power does not belong to CFA, it belongs to the MPCSC. Mm -hmm. So that's something they cannot accept. So that's why they issue the interpretation. Mm -hmm. So therefore, Hong Kong, of course, they didn't say, do anything explicitly to repeal it, but basically to said that the decision interpretation was incorrect. But Hong Kong later, our CFA itself has said in later judgments that the MPCSC, any decisions made by the MPCSC will be binding uh, on our courts. Mm -hmm. We have to follow unconditional. So there, there was a sort of swing in Hong Kong. The swing, originally they want to set a big scope and then they completely said, we'll follow everything you say. And that has opened a problem, another problem for Hong Kong, because now I believe that MPCSC has done, has acted upon it. You said you're going to follow everything we say. So, because for some matters, you can say under the basic law, the MPCSC is not supposed to do. And they, there are certain conditions in, in, in order for them to make a decision or uh, issue an interpretation. But then say, our courts have said it by itself, whatever decisions you made, whatever interpretation you make, we'll, we'll follow. So unless they go back, but now I don't think it's extremely difficult for them to go back. Thank you for clarifying that point. Um, right. I would suggest having one more question because I see we're running out of time, if that is all right. Um, yeah. I see that um, 
Jean-Raphael has asked a, another question, um, and I think maybe you have partially also given your view on that during your concluding remarks um, in respect of uh, the new constitutional normalcy that we are moving towards. Um, he is asking, what is the role of LegCo um, today since the PRC is uh, taking decisions in its place or taking more um, or that the principle has evolved, that they see that more um, decisions can be made from the mainland that are imposed on uh, Hong Kong. He refers here to the example, like the choice of candidates. And as we mentioned already, the electoral uh, uh, system and law. So he's wondering kind of towards the future, what this means for LegCo and its role. LegCo's role, if you look at the, I think now the, the, the fundamental change to the the rules of game is the elect electoral rules. Okay. That means the, the result the central government wants to achieve is that no, how should we say, no strong opponents who are against every decision made by the central government would have an opportunity to be elected as a member of the LegCo or become a member of a government official. You'd oppose the gov central government or the local government's decision within the institutions. That's the result that they want to achieve. You can oppose my policy, that's fine, but you don't get into my institutions, become a member of my institution to use my money to oppose me. So that's the, the sort of result that the sort of electoral reform uh, wants to achieve this time. But then there may have a negative consequence that is even uh, genuine or minor opponents were not really against every decision of the government, but there's, they do have genuine objection to those certain policies. Those are valid ones, may be excluded from the system, or become members of the system. But having said that, if you look at the decisions this time, that though they have changed the, part, the sort of electoral rules, but they have not changed the functions of the LegCo itself. In other words, the main provisions of the basic law have not been changed at all. Okay, only the two append appendix, appendix one, appendix two, with regard to the election of the LegCo and the chief executive. So therefore, to my simple answer there will be, all those functions of the LegCo as stated in the basic law remain. Okay. Those rules are still there. Okay. They still need to approve the budget and to conduct a sort of supervision of the government and all those. Okay. Uh, the only issue is whether they will live up to the expectation to execute or perform those functions properly. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Lin. Uh, I see that our time has approximately run out. Um, so I would like to thank our audience very much uh, for attending, uh, the participants for the very interesting questions. Uh, but most of all, of course, Professor Lin, thank you very much for this very interesting webinar and touching upon uh, all the questions during Q&A. Uh, it was uh, very insightful and really very appreciated for you taking the time out of your schedule to meet with us today. So thank you very much. Um, I wish everyone a very happy rest of the afternoon as well. So thank you. Right. Bye. Thank you, Professor Lin.